Good evening and welcome to the first ever EAUN webinar organised by the European Association of Urology Nurses. I'm excited to say that we have over 130 registrations from 34 different countries around the globe and special thanks to the Australian and New Zealand crew as I appreciate it's an early start. It's really impressive given the extreme pressure everyone is under at the moment so thank you and we hope that you're able to take something away from this webinar tonight. My name is Catherine Chatterton. I'm a bladder cancer clinical nurse specialist at Guy's Hospital in London, and I'm on the EAUN Special Interest Group for Bladder Cancer. My conflicts of interest are as shown. And before we start, firstly, I'd like to say a huge thank you to the EAUN for organizing this event because without all of their help we, behind the scenes, we would not have been able to uh, arrange this. And secondly, thank you to Medac Pharma for their very kind sponsorship. During this webinar, please feel free to ask any questions through the question portal. And at the end of each talk, we will have five minutes to hopefully address some of these. This webinar is also accredited with one continuing nurse education point which will be awarded after completing the post webinar questionnaire. The UK reached a significant and sobering moment in the pandemic yesterday with more than a hundred thousand people having died from the virus. I think that you will agree that life has altered dramatically for everyone around the world since COVID-19 appeared a year ago and nursing has been transformed. Nurses are being redeployed, intensive care units are struggling with a surge in demand and our normal working patterns are being significantly altered. In addition to this, nurses are being affected as colleagues are removed from the workforce, either from being at risk or perhaps being exposed to the virus, self-isolating or redeployment. And as a result, we are all being forced to reconsider the appropriate course of action for patients dealing with urological issues. Now, firstly, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Sachin Mulde, who is a consultant urological surgeon at Guy's Hospital in London. He specializes in non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and functional urology. Sachin is going to take a closer look at learning experiences and the future management of bladder cancer for patients during this pandemic. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for the um, introduction. Um, and thank you also to the uh, EAUN and the organizers um, of this webinar for inviting me to talk on the uh, management of bladder cancer um, during COVID-19. Uh, and um, I'm uh, excited to share our experiences and also to learn uh, from others. Uh, I have no uh, conflict of interest. So um, just as a, as a way of update, uh, as of a few days ago, the death rate from coronavirus was continuing to increase. Uh, and in Europe, the death rate continues to rise exponentially. Um, and there have been almost 1 billion cases uh, reported worldwide and just over 2 million uh, deaths. So this uh, virus has had a monumental impact um, economically, socially, psychologically, and also, of course, on uh, healthcare services. Uh, and aside from all the other health, um, health issues, uh, there's been a big impact on cancer services. Um, in England alone, uh, last year, um, it's reported that there were 42,000 uh, so-called missing uh, diagnoses. Uh, missing cancer diagnoses based on what we would have expected the number to be from previous uh, year's figures. Uh, and there are lots of reasons for that. Uh, and it could be that patients uh, obviously are less um, likely to go to their doctors in the first place. Uh, they don't want to expose themselves to the increased uh, risk of coronavirus or that they um, think that they don't want to overload the system. Uh, GPs may not be referring patients um, as much, uh, and even if they are referred in hospital, uh, we're having lots of delays with uh, diagnostics uh, and various investigations, uh, and that also impacts uh, on cancer diagnosis. Uh, 
Uh, and this can be seen clearly with some of the figures here just from England. Um, and this is all from Macmillan Cancer Support. But um, these figures look at the first wave of the pandemic between March and April last year. And you can see a clear dip um, around March, April time in terms of uh, GP appointments, uh, urgent cancer referrals, and also um, the diagnostic tests, the number of diagnostic tests that were undertaken. And this is imaging as well as endoscopy, cystoscopy. And a big survey of uh, urologists uh, worldwide kind of confirms this and um, shows that there were about 30% of people now having delays of over eight weeks in um, waiting for outpatient clinic appointments, investigations, or um, surgery uh, for urological conditions. And uh, with COVID now, uh, there are a number of aspects we need to consider when deciding how best to manage patients. Um, the first is with the social distancing uh, requirements, and that affects uh, the way we can run outpatient clinics. Um, there's been a big move towards telephone and virtual clinics, which, uh, which is good for some people, but doesn't work for everyone. Um, and so it does limit our ability to see um, patients face-to-face, -face, uh, limits our ability to uh, examine patients, to do uh, cystoscopies and other diagnostics, and also uh, affects our ability to uh, treat patients with intravesical therapies, for example. Uh, in terms of staffing, as Catherine mentioned at the start, um, there are big considerations now around uh, loss of staffing. And that can happen for various reasons, uh, either direct illness uh, to, to the staff member um, or having to self-isolate because a close contact has been um, uh, positive for COVID um, or if they've been redeployed to other areas. And this has a big impact on our ability to run theatres, um, inpatient care, uh, and also, most importantly, ICU availability, which impacts on our ability to do um, major uh, uh, cancer surgery. In the first wave, we had some uh, barriers with uh, PPE availability and, and having the right PPE, um, which also affected the way we were managing patients. Uh, but this seems to have been uh, resolved, at least in the UK, um, uh, during the second uh, wave. Um, and we also need to consider the risk of infection to patients. And of course, this is the, the big thing that we need to balance. Um, we're now exposing um, patients to a higher risk environment, a higher risk of contracting COVID. And we need to balance the benefits of treatment and what we're trying to achieve uh, with that, uh, as well as discussing with them the risks of no treatment uh, and trying to work out what the best strategy going forward would be for the individual patient. Uh, and now with vaccine availability, we need to work out how to use this in the best way so that we can safely uh, restart a lot of our elective work. Uh, so how has COVID affected our bladder cancer population specifically? Uh, well, this was pre-COVID-19, uh, kind of the good old days, and this is the standard pathway where a patient would come to a one-stop uh, clinic where we could uh, see them face to face, examine them, um, do a urine cytology, uh, cystoscopy on the day, um, and then send them off for various diagnostic tests such as a CT scan. Uh, we would then bring them in for their TURBT, um, give them post-operative mitomycin if appropriate, and then discuss all those results in our MDT and make a further plan for management as required. With COVID-19, this has all really been <coughs> turned on its head. Um, and we've had to think of new and innovative ways to try to uh, maintain diagnostics um, and also to reduce delays in, in the pathway for uh, a lot of these patients. And so uh, we're doing uh, a lot of diagnostics on the day uh, with CT scan, cystoscopy and cytology. Um, and we're also uh, doing a, a pinch biopsy of the bladder tumour at the same time uh, as the flexible cystoscopy, which I'll uh, come to a bit later, but that's really sped up our time to diagnosis. Uh, we're relying on imaging a lot more, especially for the large invasive tumours. Uh, we uh, rely on MRI to, to give us uh, more accurate staging uh, and then decide whether the patient needs a transurethral resection or whether they go to radical treatment with uh, cystectomy chemoradiotherapy. 
And we do have guidance uh, from uh, EAU, and in the UK, we also have our British Association guidance, uh, which does give us really clear um, criteria by which we can prioritize uh, patients. And the key um, really is uh, risk stratifying patients early on, um, especially our bladder cancer patients. So what do we do with diagnostics? Well, at the moment in the UK, these, these are our British Association guidelines. And if someone has hematuria, uh, traditionally we would have seen them in, in a, in a one-stop setup, a hematuria clinic. And we're still doing this uh, now, even with reduced service provision. So these patients with visible hematuria are still at the highest priority and we still um, maintain our services uh, for these patients uh, as urgently as we can. And EAU would recommend that these patients are still seen within six weeks. Uh, of course, uh, we have therefore deprioritized some other areas and uh, patients with non-visible hematuria will often have their investigations deferred. So we prioritize the high risk symptoms uh, and how about the treatments? Well, the <coughs> EAU recommend that the highest priority um, patients that still need their TURBTs done within six weeks are those who are having ongoing hematuria, anyone with previous history of high risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, or those with a high grade T1 cancer who need a re-resection because there was no muscle in the original specimen. And so we are maintaining these services for this high risk group uh, because it's for these patients that you really need to make sure uh, you're on the correct path um, in terms of either bladder preservation or uh, cystectomy. Um, the low and intermediate risk tumours um, are therefore deferred and uh, often up to three to six months depending on service provision. Um, in our clinic, we've tried to use pinch biopsy, as I mentioned earlier, as uh, a way to really improve the time to diagnosis. And uh, this procedure involves uh, taking a biopsy at the time of the initial flexible cystoscopy in clinic. Uh, you can take some samples of tumour, send them off for histological analysis, and it has a number of benefits. Um, firstly, it helps us to triage our patients. So we can more effectively work out whether someone is low, intermediate or high risk based on histology. Uh, we can then determine uh, the priority of our TURBT waiting lists. And in those who have large invasive tumours, actually this may allow us to omit the TURBT step altogether by using MRI to evaluate depth of invasion combined with the histology to then make a definitive treatment plan. In those who have small uh, tumours that appear non-invasive um, and are suitable for it, we can also ablate these tumours um, in the outpatient setting. And so that also uh, avoids the patient having to have um, an inpatient admission and a general anaesthetic, and therefore exposure to increased risks of, of coronavirus. So how does it work for patients uh, with who are on intravesical uh, treatment? Um, well, a lot of patients with BCG have already suffered in the last few years with BCG shortages. Um, and now, again, we have to rationalize BCG uh, further due to uh, the effect of COVID. And so the EAU recommend um, that patients with high risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer still go on for induction and maintenance BCG for up to a year. And this is what we are, we are doing. Um, and anyone with low or intermediate risk disease having um, intravesical mitomycin um, would be uh, deferred in this setting. In terms of surveillance, <clears throat> there's um, uh, the highest priority group are those who, uh, who are having ongoing hematuria. And those with high risk non-muscle invasive disease, uh, we're still trying to prioritize, uh, but potentially uh, uh, often deferred up to three months. Uh, and the low and intermediate risks are, are deferred even up to six months. So it really highlights the importance of a good risk classification early on for these patients. Uh, but this does have the effect um, of creating a big backlog down the line and also creates a lot of anxiety for patients. <clears throat> In terms of muscle invasive disease, we know that actually a delay to radical cystectomy does have a big impact in terms of overall survival. So uh, although the EAU uh, would suggest that even for the high risk non-muscle invasive or muscle invasive disease, uh, this may have to be deferred up to three months, uh, we um, in the UK uh, still try to maintain our cystectomy service as a priority, especially for those with 
muscle invasive disease, uh, followed by those with high risk non-muscle invasive disease, unless the service provision um, is so reduced that that's not even possible, in which case we, uh, in our MDT format, may need to think of other options such as radical radiotherapy. And we know that this is a safe way to do things. Um, we looked at the safety of using a so-called cold site or a green site uh, in the UK. Uh, and this is uh, aiming to keep elective surgery uh, going. It's a separate site to the emergency site. Um, and it's aiming to create a COVID free zone uh, by having patients self isolate for two weeks prior to admission. Um, all patients would have a negative uh, PCR swab prior to admission and staff also self test twice a week. Um, and we found that with this uh, regime, uh, risk of uh, contracting COVID is uh, about 3% and the risk of uh, mortality from a COVID uh, related post-surgical complication is very low at 0.3%. So what about the future? Um, with increased availability of vaccination, we hope that this would make things much safer and we can restart a lot of our services in a safe way. In the UK, we're prioritizing cancer patients um, undergoing chemotherapy or immunotherapy, as well as elderly patients. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how this can affect things going forward. Um, telephone clinics and virtual consultations are um, likely to stay, and I think are a good thing for a lot of patients, but we do need to select patients well for this, uh, because clearly it's not appropriate for everyone. And I think one area where there's been a lot of innovation um, as a response to this a pandemic and the challenges faced with diagnostics has been the, the rapid development and validation of different biomarkers. And um, I think in the next couple of years, we're going to see a lot more of these biomarkers being used routinely um, to help with risk stratification, to help to reduce hospital visits, uh, and also to rationalize cystoscopy for the highest risk uh, groups. So thank you very much for um, listening and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sachin. Um, I think as this pandemic unfolds, um, we're learning more about how to adapt with situations and patient management. And as Sachin certainly demonstrated through this, how well we're learning to adjust uh, during these tremendously difficult times. Um, as mentioned um, as well by Sachin, we have the EAU website uh, for reference on the COVID-19 recommendations from the Rapid Reaction Group, uh, which is always uh, good to have to hand if you're unsure of recommendations. Very good question come through here. So, yeah. Um, Sachin, do you think we're likely to continue uh, with the new pathways uh, once we're back to normal? So do you think, you know, we're going to change the way that we practice? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, um, I think a lot of things will stay the same. I think we've noticed that there's a lot of um, benefits to the way we're having to do things now. Mm. And for a lot of patients, um, potentially a big advantage. Uh, the one group I think where it has the biggest advantage is the clearly and obviously muscle invasive group. So those with, you know, very large tumors, tumors that are clearly invasive on imaging. Um, whereas previously we would proceed with a TURBT and the, you know, wait two to three weeks for that to happen, then bring them back another couple of weeks later in the MDT then make a plan. Actually this way uh, we biopsy straight off from the first visit have the histology ready with the imaging within two weeks and can make a definitive uh, treatment plan. So I think, you know, there are definite advantages with uh, some of our pathways now. Thank you. Um, lots of questions coming in. Don't worry, Sachin, I'm going to answer this one. Um, on the advice we give to patients having uh, immunotherapy treatment, so BCG. Um, so our medical management at Guy's Hospital has advised us that the patient cannot have the COVID jab uh, for 24 hours prior or after. And we've actually been saying to our patients, it's probably best to wait a week after they've had their BCG just because of the side effects and not mix and matching if they're feeling unwell. But our medical management has said 24 hours prior, 24 hours after. So that answers that. And that leads us nicely onto um, 
our next speaker. So I'm going to now introduce um, Sarah Spencer Bowdedge, who is a patient support officer for Action Bladder Cancer UK. This is a UK registered charity supporting bladder cancer patients with fantastic resources for patients, including a wealth of literature. And they're also heavily involved in helping to raise the awareness of bladder cancer and supporting research into the disease. Sarah has been involved in developing and running a survey for bladder cancer patients that looked at the effect of COVID uh, to understand the impact for our uh, patients uh, with bladder cancer and what the long-term implications may be. So not with uh, giving any more away, I'm going to uh, pass you over to Sarah. Many thanks. Thank you very much and thank you very much for the opportunity to share the results of our survey. Um, I work for the charity Action Bladder Cancer UK as a patient support officer. Um, just want to say I have no conflicts of interest. Um, so the work of Action Bladder Cancer UK is sort of broadly under three themes. So improving patient support is really key for us. And we offer direct patient support where someone can contact the charity and be put in touch with help and support via email or on telephone. We also, as Catherine mentioned, have a wide range of resources which can be downloaded for free from our website. Um, the most recent of which is Living with a Urostomy, which was written by people who are living with a Urostomy and has lots of really useful tips. We also work towards improving outcomes for bladder cancer patients. Um, so that might be around increasing awareness of signs and symptoms um, and looking to improve early diagnosis for bladder cancer patients. And then um, we also look to improve research into bladder cancer. So we have um, various um, projects that we fund directly as well as working with um, other funders. Um, some of our uh, research is specific or funding is specifically available for nurses in the UK who have a project that they would like to try out that could improve outcomes for bladder cancer patients. So why did we run the survey? Well, um, back in March and April of last year, there was lots of sort of publicity in the media about the fact that COVID-19 was having a huge impact on cancer patients. And we know that bladder cancer is often diagnosed late, has a very high recurrence rate and a high mortality rate. And we wanted to understand um, and get information on how bladder cancer patients were being affected and how hospitals were coping and adapting to the huge challenge. Um, we wanted the information really to allow us to respond appropriately to patients, to raise these issues with um, various uh, groups and also to help us support health professionals. So um, before I uh, carry on, I just want to make some acknowledgements um, and say thank you to um, the trustees that are both patients and clinicians of Action Bladder Cancer UK for their input into the survey, as well as my colleagues. And then we also worked with um, the Translational Oncology and Urology Research Team at King's College and Dr. Rick Bryan of the Bladder Cancer Research Centre at the University of Birmingham, all who contributed to the survey. So the survey ran from the 22nd of April last year until the 22nd of July. Uh, we used SurveyMonkey as the platform and promoted it through our website, through social media platforms such as Twitter um, and Facebook. And also we work closely with patient support groups around the UK and we used them to help sort of spread the word about the survey. Um, there were 156 responses, um, over 94% of which lived in England. 34% of those were from rural areas, 29% from urban cities, and 22% from major conurbations such as London and Greater Manchester. 80% of the respondents were aged 60 years or older, and more than 68% were men. When we um, asked them what type of bladder cancer they had, 71% had non-muscle invasive, 22% muscle invasive, and 3% advanced metastatic disease. So the respondents were broadly reflective of um, bladder cancer patients in the UK generally. Um, this was the first survey we'd ever done. So there was some learning to do and there were some limitations to the survey. So obviously it was only um, filled in by people who had access to the internet. Um, and I guess you also were already aware of our charity or attending the support groups that we mentioned. Um, it was also quite a small sample size and it was, um, questions that were unvalidated. 
Um, so we asked people about uh, the impact on treatment and monitoring that they were experiencing and 49% described disruption to their treatment or follow-up, 33% said that treatment or follow-up was proceeding as normal and 18% um, were scheduled to follow up in the future. Um, we also looked to see if there was a difference between those people in rural areas and those people in urban areas um, in terms of the disruption to their treatment, um, wondering whether maybe in urban areas the hospitals were finding it um, more difficult to cope with the number of COVID patients, but actually we found no difference at all between disruption for people in rural areas and people in urban areas. Um, we asked patients um, where there were delays to their treatment, how the hospitals were informing them. So approximately 50% uh, were told by telephone, 27% received a letter, 2% a text message, and then a further 21% said that they'd actually contacted the hospital themselves, perhaps aware from the media that there was likely to be delays or disruption to their treatment. Um, we also asked if people felt um, the pandemic had made it more difficult to communicate with their urology team. Um, unsurprisingly, given what was going on, 39% reported that it had, but of course, that meant that um, almost 61% sort of actually didn't feel that the pandemic had made it more difficult to communicate with their urology team, which is fantastic. Um, so this, we looked in a little bit more detail um, and actually the, this, these results were published in the British Journal of Urology International um, in November. So if you wanted to read a bit more, um, you can find this through there. It's also linked to, um, there's a link on our website. So eight respondents were awaiting initial TERB T, two of which had been delayed or postponed. 16 patients were awaiting a subsequent TERB T, six of which had been delayed or postponed. 97 patients described being under surveillance, um, 51 or 53% of which reported a delay or postponement to their surveillance. And about 70% of patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer reported delays, postponements or curtailments to their treatment. 17 patients were awaiting cystectomy, nine had been notified of a postponement in their surgery, and three had been notified of a cancellation of their surgery. Of the eight patients undergoing treatment for locally advanced or metastatic disease, five described disruption to the administration of chemotherapy. Um, so I, I guess what this shows is that obviously there, there was disruption um, across the board for bladder cancer patients for those currently receiving treatment as well as those um, in monitoring, but um, as Sachin brought up, obviously in some cases that would have been very justified by the risk of that patient contracting COVID-19 if they'd gone into hospital. Um, so we also asked if people had hospital appointments, whether they were being offered an alternative. Um, 36 said yes, they'd been given a telephone consultation. One was offered a video consultation. Um, 28 said no, they were uh, continuing to have their appointments at the hospital as normal. Um, and 34 had had their appointments cancelled um, and for 50 people they didn't have any hospital consultations due. Um, we wanted to find a bit out about how people were feeling obviously um, and so we asked people uh, yes whether they were anxious specifically about the pandemic affecting their bladder cancer treatment. So 74% said they felt either a little anxious or very anxious about the current pandemic affecting their treatment for bladder cancer but just over a quarter of people said they didn't feel anxious at all. Um, and again, we asked if people were concerned about actually attending the hospital. Um, and the majority of people, I think unsurprisingly, felt a little concerned or very concerned about attending hospital for appointments. Um, so we also asked, um, bearing in mind this was early on in the pandemic, what would help people to feel safe when returning to hospital? Um, there wasn't a huge discrepancy um, between the options that we gave, so um, people were keen to see no queuing, safety precautions for themselves, so that would be PPE, potentially masks and gloves, and again the same for staff, separate COVID-free provision for cancer patients in their usual hospital, and then a little bit less popular was the idea of a separate COVID-free unit um, in a different building from normal, and I, I guess it may be that no one knows where that would be and whether that would be as easy to get to or um, or tricky to get to for them. So just to draw some conclusions, obviously and, and unsurprisingly it's uh, an extremely challenging and worrying time for bladder cancer patients. Um, there have been positives and um, we've 
obviously get a lot of um, uh, contact from patients generally and um, and people have liked some of the new ways of working so it was interesting to hear what um, Sachin say what might be staying. Um, I think people definitely have liked uh, not waiting around so much um, and we've had reports that less red tape has meant that new ways of working have been easier to implement um, and many measures were very quickly put in place to keep people safe um, and we've also sort of had feedback that in some hospitals bladder cancer was made a clinical priority. Um, in terms of next steps, ABC UK Action Bladder Cancer um, needs to continue to monitor the situation and um, I think when we did the survey initially we would never have thought that we would be where we are now at the beginning of 2021. Um, so we have just launched uh, in the last few days a follow-up survey working again with um, King's College London. So um, any UK based nurses that could spread the word for us that would be great. You can um, find the link on our website. Um, with this latest survey we have repeated some of the questions from the first survey but we've also asked questions for example about the COVID-19 vaccine. Have people already received it and it'd be interesting to see if that maybe has an impact on their answers. Um, and also we've looked to understand what's happened in terms of the support networks for people in the longer term. Um, and lastly, we plan to continue to run surveys um, and use other research methodologies as well to try and understand the long-term impact of the pandemic on bladder cancer patients. Um, and yes, please do get in touch via the website or drop me a line if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I think there are some very um, valid points of concern uh, that have been raised here from this survey. I think from, um, and it would be interesting to see if the disruption to the intracycle treatment as well is different on your follow-up survey if you're asking about that, because I know that hospitals are managing that situation um, slightly differently this time round. Um, but I think, um, for example, what is it, a third of patients found it more difficult to communicate with their teams. There was postponement of surgery. 75% uh, of patients that you mentioned felt anxious about their treatment being affected. Well, of course they did. Um, but how, how can we as a team and nurses make patients feel safer about coming back into hospital? These are all things that we're actively having to deal with daily from telephone calls to emails. Um, but I guess we also have to remember, you know, how well we've adapted to. It's not all the sort of the negativity signs of things as well. Um, I think also you mentioned, I think it'd be very interesting for the viewers to um, look at the published work in the British Journal of Urology as well. And I'd highly recommend reading this. Uh, just to understand the patient's perspective, uh, demonstrating the effects to delays and cancellations in patients, which we as a group of nurses can certainly relate to. So let's just look at the questions. Let's have a look. Oh, are your leaflets available in other languages? Very interesting website. Nice work. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. But I'm afraid they're not at the moment. Um, I think we're yeah we're a, a very small organisation and it's probably not within our capabilities to make them available in lots of different languages at the moment. Um, I think that there possibly are is software available that would be able to translate them, but for the moment they're only available in English. Okay. Um, also, um, so you mentioned about surveys. What um, did you ask about patients in the surveys about shielding? We did. Um, and yeah, so yeah, I haven't um, shown you all the questions we asked because we didn't quite have time. So um, do have a look on our website at the full survey. But we did ask people um, firstly whether they'd been advised to shield. Um, also, if they weren't advised, whether they shielded anyway. Um, and we also asked them a bit about self-isolating, whether um, they were self-isolating. And in, in most cases, um, it was sort of just under half of people said they had been advised to shield. And of those that hadn't, Again, just under half said they were shielding anyway, which I think shows the sort of anxiety at the time um, around, yes, the, the COVID pandemic. But it would be interesting to know whether that's something that feels the same now when we are so much further along the line. Um, 
Yes, perhaps having the vaccination, patients might not feel that they want to shield so much and fed up of the situation. And it'd be really interesting to perhaps add that into the survey to see if you get a, a different response this time. Yes, yeah, definitely. Excellent. Great. Any more questions? Let's just have a look. Uh, oh, yes. Great one. Um, did your organisation get inundated with patient queries at the start of the pandemic? That is a very good question. Um, what we actually found was that it fluctuated. So we had sort of higher for a little bit and then less for a little bit. Um, and we're actually now starting to or doing a piece of work to really look at the, what those queries were and to try and sort of understand quite what was going and how those queries changed at that point to say like a year earlier. So, um, so it wasn't sort of a, yeah, it wasn't a complete deluge. It was more a wave in terms of um, peak and then and actually slightly fewer. Mm. And I guess that's what we're seeing as well, actually, at the moment. We, you know, in, in the early stages, we were all asked if, you know, should the patient be, should I be shielding? Um, you know, am I allowed to go out? Whereas that seems to have tapered off this time round um, during this um, second wave, certainly for us anyway. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. It's lovely. Um, now on to Suzanne. Lastly, but not least, um, I'd like to introduce Suzanne Vare. Uh, who is well known to many of us. She's a clinical nurse specialist at the University of Copenhagen and also the chair of the EAUN and a professional researcher and lecturer. Suzanne recently presented at Bowne in November last year and was warmly received exploring courage in nurses during these COVID times. So I'll now hand over to Suzanne. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much for giving me the possibility to present this once more and thank you to all of you nurses who are sitting out there and have chosen to spend one hour with the EAUN. As a current chair, I'm quite proud to be part of this very first webinar, as Catherine told you. I have the following conflicts of interest to declare. And then first of all, I have a short update. We were actually updated by session and you can see on this slide, it shows uh, the current situation of cases, but only in Europe. And as you can see, we are still in the middle of the pandemic and then you can call it wave two or wave three, we don't quite know, but we know that the cases are still rising in many countries. This slide shows the number of deaths in the same period. And this slide is probably more interesting because it also reflects the pressure put on hospitals. Now with the, that we know that lots of the young ones that were, were infected get few symptoms. And we also know that being older than 70 increases the risk of death almost fivefold. And these numbers are to remind you that the situation is still serious. Although we have adapted to the new normal and the majority of us not live in the same emotional limbo as we did in March. When I was preparing this presentation, I started wondering exactly what is courage? And did nurses show courage during COVID-19 or were they just dutiful? I looked for the definition of courage and it is defined as a quality of mind or spirit that enables a person to face difficulty, danger and pain without fear and with firmness. Examples of courageous persons are the first one, the lady Odette Samson, she was a British spy working in occupied France during the Second World War. She was betrayed by a double agent a year, a year later. Samson was captured, she was tortured in jail. And despite this inhuman treatment she was put through, she did not reveal the identity of any colleagues. She was eventually sentenced to death and sent to a concentration camp, but her execution was never carried out and she survived the war. She spent, a, she spent the years following her release working for charities which aimed to lessen the pain of war and was awarded the George Cross for her service. The second example is from 1989 and is a picture of the white-shirted protester facing down a column of Chinese tanks alone. This has become one of the most iconic images of rebellion and courage. 
as the column of tanks rolled into a square, a lone figure blocked their path. The protester was eventually pulled back into the crowd and his or her identity is still unknown. But the photograph of a single person standing up to power has taken on a life on its own. And this last example shows that courageous persons do not need to be known by name nor by profession. I would like you to try and turn back time to the beginning of the epidemic, back in March when we knew very little about COVID-19, how it develops, how to treat the symptoms, and who were mainly infected. I still recall the uncertainty expressed by the nurses in our department who were pregnant and told they should continue working because they were not at risk. Today we know better and they are removed from contact with patients four weeks earlier than normal. And in Denmark, we have the right to stop working eight weeks before delivery. So now there's no patient contact is recommended for 12 weeks before delivery. With the definition of courage in mind, I will now show you Danish and Italian numbers of nurses infected with COVID-19. The Danish numbers are from October 2020. 2.2% in the general population are tested positive, while 7% of nurses are tested positive. In Italy, the situation was very different, different from the Danish one regarding mortality. 9% of healthcare professionals are, were tested positive. 151 doctors and more than 40 nurses died from COVID-19. So even though I speak from a European perspective, the COVID-19 situation differs a lot across Europe. At a time where the rest of Europe apparently did not believe we would face an Italian situation, we watched pictures showing military trucks carry coffins of the dead out of Bergamo, a town overwhelmed by the pandemic, and we saw pictures of healthcare professionals working under unknown conditions. I have conferred with the former chair of EAUN, Stefano Tassoni, to give you the right picture of what happened in Italy. And he told me, that patients admitted to the hospitals were obviously not allowed to receive visits from external persons. The relatives saw the person being carried away to the hospital and they could only receive information by phone and in case of death, receive the ashes of the persons because for weeks, funerals had been prohibited. Nurses were the last persons that patients had beside them and often picked up the last words, wills and thoughts. This is a quote from one of the nurses who took care of the COVID-19 patients. What I will never forget are the eyes of the patients. The rest of their faces was covered with masks, but the eyes told their stories without the need for any words, fear, hope, and loneliness. And now I think we should stay silent for a moment to remember the frontline workers and for you to read the poem Silence written by an Italian nurse. Thanks to Manuela Pupni. She's a registered nurse who currently work at the hospital of Picienta for sharing her thoughts with us. This poem affects me and makes me able to gain a little more insight in what Italian nurses experienced in the spring. And now we'll move on and present studies about how COVID-19 has influenced nurses. Previous studies show that during sudden natural disasters and infectious diseases, nurses will sacrifice their own needs 
to actively participate in the anti-epidemic work. And they will, selfless, they, will, they will make selfless contributions out of moral and professional responsibilities. This was also found in a study from Sonnedal, who investigated the experience, the psychological experience of caregivers of COVID-19 patients. More than 70% of the participants mentioned that professional responsibility prompted them to participate in the mission to contain the epidemic. And nurses reviewed the value of the nursing profession and identified more with their, with their chosen profession. Not surprisingly, caring for COVID-19 patients affected nurses' physical and mental well-being. They experienced an increased workload, physical exhaustion, inadequate personal equipment, and the need to make ethically difficult decisions on the rationing of care. Having an increased workload and feeling physically exhausted impact nurses' resilience, and resilience can be further compromised by isolation and loss of social support risk of infections of friends and relatives, as well as huge and often unsettling changes in the ways of working, which we have been heard of before today. In another study, and this one was a meta-analysis of 13 studies with a combined total of 33,062 participants. And they analyzed data about anxiety, depression, and insomnia. They found that 23% of healthcare professionals had symptoms of anxiety, 23% had symptoms of depression, and 36% experienced insomnia. A subgroup analysis revealed gender and occupational differences with female healthcare professionals and nurses exhibiting higher rates of affective symptoms compared to male and medical staff. And these results tell us about depression and anxiety rates in the short term but not in the long term. Will more nurses be diagnosed with post-traumatic stress syndrome in the future? We know from studies, uh, we know from the outbreak in Singapore of SARS back in 2016, that 20% of the healthcare workers were diagnosed with PTSD two months after. We also know that survivors of, of infectious diseases have higher rates, have higher rates of post-traumatic stress disorder and as nurses are more exposed to infections, there will also be many survivors of the COVID-19, making nurses not only caregivers, but also survivors. Predictors of stress was a past history of psychiatric illness, and also being a young nurse with limited years of experience, and the perception of adequate training and support. The rapid transmission rate of COVID-19 led to tasks that healthcare professionals may not have been adequately, adequately equipped to deal with, so from both the professional and psychological view, viewpoint. Findings from the two studies can help to quantify staff support needs and inform tailored interventions under conditions like COVID-19 that enhance resilience and mitigate vulnerability among healthcare workers. Studies point to the timely and correct dissemination of information and the provision of adequate training and resources. Education of both healthcare workers and the public can reduce stigma and discrimination and psychosocial support needs to be available in order to enhance psychological resilience among healthcare workers. Immediate interventions are essential, the researchers conclude. So I try to look to the internet to see what health was provided. And luckily, <clears throat> the year of 2020, 2021 was designated the year of the nurse by the World Health Assembly. In their campaign, they write, nurses and midwives are often the first and only point of care in their communities. The world needs 9 million more nurses and, mid and midwives. And if it is to achieve universal health coverage by 2030. So what help was nurses offered uh, who cared for the patients with the COVID-19. They said nurses deserve praise, thanks, protection amid COVID-19. And apparently they still believe that the calling is what attracts young people to the nursing profession. <clears throat> In Italy, you need to seek help yourself. Are you a nurse struck during the fight against COVID-19? 
find out how to access the Solidarity Fund. A recent study showed that 50% of healthcare professionals had accessed psychological resources through media, reflecting that the need for support is currently not covered by authorities. And in America, the American Academy of Nursing even have a COVID-19 Courage Award. I think that the picture drawn in the media and by researchers are the opposite. And this may, might make it difficult to get the appropriate help. Do heroes or courageous persons seek mental help? Research points to the need for guidelines to make sure immediate help is offered to frontline nurses working with the COVID-19 patients. The opinion of this last slide represents my own and is, is not necessarily the same as uh, the opinion of the EAUN. Because is this the other side of the coin? Is the risk of articulating a professional responsibility that not only the mental health of nurses are being neglected, but also that politicians believe nursing is still a true calling and not a profession they need to pay a decent salary? In Denmark, we see that nurses do not volunteer to put in a state of readiness during the second wave. In one part of Denmark, they look for 1,500 nurses and 15 volunteered because of poor payment. And I found this on the internet and I can see nurses in England experience exactly the same thing. Thank you very much, Suzanne. <clears throat> I think it's frightening to look at the numbers there of uh, nurses testing positive compared with the public, isn't it? I mean, that really does show who's on the front line there. Um, and compassion with a mask as well. It's, it's so, so difficult to to show those feelings through that and have the compassion with the patients. And I think for all of us, it has been, and it still continues to be a very difficult time in nursing. But, you know, we didn't know what we were dealing with in the beginning. And this was obviously coupled with anxiety and uncertainty, which is now unfortunately being exacerbated by the second wave alongside exhaustion as well. I think we can see from this that, you know, the COVID um, pandemic is testing the resources and capacity of health systems around the world. Um, it really is. Now, let's have a look at some questions. Amazing presentation. <laughs> Not quite a question. <laughs> I, I've got a question for you. Um, let's have a look. Um, what do you think can be done to help nurses manage stress during the COVID pandemic? If we look at the experiences from earlier, then we know that uh, a lot of nurses uh, do things themselves to um, cope with the stress. What works for a lot of them is to uh, use the mindfulness to try to, uh, to get de-stressed and they use um, uh, diaries to write down what the thoughts have been. They often uh, solve their stress uh, with themselves and then they use, they use their colleagues. What is needed in the future, I think, is that the managers and the departments take responsibility. There have been some small products I know uh, around in Denmark where they try to practice mindfulness uh, with nurses only for 10, 15 minutes. Then they give the nurses a break during the working day take them away from the patients, uh, take off all the protective equipment, and then they just have 10 minutes to clear their minds before they go back uh, to take care of the patients. And they can see that this has a, a good impact. But I think that the managers need to take um, the responsibility if we want uh, the nurses to get through this uh, epidemic in a good way. And I think one of the big challenges is only it's not only the mental health on the, of the individual nurse, it's also these nurses that are going to take care of the cancer patients in the future. So if we have a lot of uh, nurses being of sick leave, nurses um, having the post-traumatic stress syndrome, then we have fewer nurses to take care of the cancer patients. And as you can see, the WHO says it's a huge problem that we have uh, as a shortage of nurses. So uh, I think that it, we, we need to take this seriously, that it, it is not just something that is common to the nurses to go and take care of people. It is really, really has a great impact when you meet so many, uh, so much horror and so many people dying every day. <laughs> 
No, I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, I'm just looking at, there's another question that's come through. Um, uh, Sarah, I'm just wondering, do you know of any bladder cancer support group meetings running virtually? Have, has anybody asked you about that? Um, yes. So um, actually, one of the things we did quite early on in the pandemic was to offer free Zoom licenses to support groups to try and enable them to run them online. And actually, quite a few are now running successful um, virtual uh, support groups. But yeah, I mean, it, do get in touch with us if you're after one for a patient in a specific area and we can let you know what's happening there. But, um, but yeah, I think it's, there's been a mixed response a little bit, but um, certainly some have found it to be a really good way. And some people, especially when it's really dark outside and cold, have relished not having to travel to their meetings, but to be able to sit in the warmth of their own home. Yeah, I guess it's also having the sources and they're not necessarily getting the treatments that they were having or, you know, expecting and they can bounce it off their pals that they normally see. I think that's, yeah. that's really, yeah. mm -hmm. well, that's good to know. Fantastic. Um, there's also um, another question um, that's come through. Um, Sachin. I wonder if I could just get some help with this one. Um, both the EAUN intracycle guideline and the EAU um, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer guideline states that asymptomatic bacteria is not a contraindication for administration of intracycle BCG. But what about intracycle chemotherapy, for example, mitomycin? So if a patient with a long-term catheter on intracycle mitomycin who is regularly nitrite positive but asymptomatic, would you administer or would you use antibiotic pro prophylaxis? What would we do? The patient's high-risk category and has a contraindication to uh, BCG. Yeah, so it's a good question, actually. There's Obviously, there's guidance for uh, BCG. There's no clear guidance for giving intracycle chemotherapy. But I think, you know, if he's got a long-term catheter, he's always going to be colonized with bacteria. Mm. Um, and so, um, is, uh, but if he's high risk, he definitely needs the intracycle chemotherapy. So I would, uh, in this situation, normally give a short course of three days antibiotics each time he has an installation, just to reduce the risk of uh, getting a symptomatic UTI. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think uh, we're coming to an end now. Um, thank you very much to all our speakers. It's been um, fantastic. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. And I think it's. Um, I think now it's an important time to take a moment and reflect, because let's be honest, there isn't much time to do that at the moment. Um, I can see the smiles coming back. It's really tricky doing this and not seeing the responses from everyone. So um, remember, whether you are staying behind, uh, holding the fort in your usual workplace or changing our roles during this period, supporting other areas, we need to recognise how amazing we are. And no matter how tough times are, we need to recognise that and, and continue to achieve what we're doing during this pandemic. Um, our patients know we're there for them and we can just continue to do our very best, I think, really. Um, again, I'd like to thank um, Medac Pharma for sponsoring this webinar and also the EAUN for organising. And also a reminder to please follow the link which will be sent to you um, in the next week or so to complete the evaluation and collect your uh, CNE point. Um, please also take this opportunity to use the comments in the feedback form and perhaps you'll be able to tell us what you'd like for future webinars uh, in the bladder cancer area. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening uh, or day from Australia and continue to stay safe during these difficult times and take care and see you at the next webinar. Many thanks. <laughs>